Hello, everybody. I wanted to take a little bit of time to talk about the end of the Odyssey since we aren't able to be in class together on Monday. So during our last time together, we talked about the journeys of Odysseus, which he relates in the course of his visit with the Phaeacians. And if you remember, we talked about how the trials he faced from the time he left Troy until he arrived in Phaeacia, things like his run-ins with the Cyclops and the Lotus Eaters, uh, things like his time with Circe and Calypso and his journey to the underworld. We talked about how these things were, in a sense, preparing him for his return home. Through all of these struggles, Odysseus was moving from the savagery of the battlefield, where he and his men had slaughtered and pillaged and taken everything they could. They were moving from this ethic which had been ingrained on them during the war to a place, a, a mindset where he could receive hospitality, where he could be shown kindness and maybe even show kindness to others in turn. This is what the Phaeacians did for him. They took him in. They fed him. They gave him gifts. They showed him kindnesses. And at the end of their time together, they sent him home. And it's this homecoming that we're going to talk about specifically today. The events that unfold from the time the Phaeacians send Odysseus back to Ith Ithaca to the closing of the epic. We're going to talk about what, what this says about the hero of the story, but also about the Greeks who told the story. And, and also maybe about us, those who hear the story or read the story uh, a few thousand years later. If you've read book 13, you know what happened when the Phaeacians loaded Odysseus down with treasure and then they put him on a boat and they carried him home to Ithaca. The Phaeacian crew lifted a sleeping Odysseus from the boat the way that a, a parent might lift a sleeping toddler out of the car and they deposited him and his gifts of uh, on the beach of his homeland. Well, for this kindness, they were punished by Poseidon. Poseidon turned their ship to stone before they could get back home and reach the port of Phaeacia. And then he walled in their island so they would be cut off from the outside world. This is one of those vivid illustrations in all of in, in, in literature that, that, that no good deed goes unpunished sometimes. For their hospitality, for their kindness, for their generosity, Poseidon smites the Phaeacians in the harshest way imaginable. But back to Odysseus. He's home now after 20 years, but his homecoming isn't complete. After all, we're, we're still only in book 13. There's a lot of poem left here before we reach the conclusion. So what I want to do over the next few minutes is just to, to explore together some of the stages involved in Odysseus's homecoming, which, remember, is a central theme of this epic. To start with, the, the first stage that we encounter here might be what we would call reorientation. When Odysseus awakes, he is clearly disoriented. And by this, I mean that he is a little confused about where he is. There are a couple of reasons for this. First of all, Odysseus has been gone for 20 years. If you've ever been away from a place for a long time, you, you know that things sometimes change. You might not recognize a place that you visited, maybe even a place that you lived when you were much younger. Well, Odysseus has been gone a very long time. And so this spot on Ithaca's shore might not be as familiar to him as he would have thought. But there's another reason why he's a bit disoriented. That's because Athena has spread a haze over the land. She wants him to be confused so that she can explain things to him, so that she can ease him into this homecoming. <clears throat> but whatever the reason, it's clear from lines 208 and following in book 13 that Odysseus doesn't know where he is. We know this because he says, what land have I come to now? He fears that this might be a place where lawless savages live. He wonders what he's going to do with all of his treasure so that it won't be stolen. And as he's making a plan, Athena shows up. Little by little, she helps him to understand where he is. She tells him about the suitors at his house and what they've been up to. She involves him in a plan to take back his palace from the suitors. She even disguises him as an old wandering beggar so that they can wa wa work their plan to perfection. The second stage of Odysseus's homecoming is the stage of reunion. This is where Odysseus begins to connect with those who are most important to him. While Athena goes off to fetch Telemachus from Sparta, where he's been visiting Menelaus, Odysseus goes to visit someone very special. But it's not the person that we might be expecting. Odysseus goes to the home of Eumaeus, 
his swine herd. Of all of Odysseus's servants, Eumaeus is maybe the most trustworthy. The story of their bond is narrated to let us know that Eumaeus and Odysseus are like family. Ever since Odysseus has been gone, Eumaeus has been doing his work faithfully. He's been looking after Odysseus's pigs. He's also been longing for his master's return. Like Penelope and Telemachus, however, Eumaeus is poised somewhere between hope and despair. He doesn't know whether he'll ever see Odysseus again, but he pretty much assumes that it's a lost cause. Meanwhile, Telemachus returns to Ithaca, and in what is a telling gesture, he goes to Eumaeus' house before he goes anywhere else. Before he goes to see anyone, he, he goes to, to connect with this swine herd of his father. And it tells us something about the place that Eumaeus had in, in, in Odysseus' family. When the swine herd sees Odysseus' son, they embrace like family. And it's here in the home of Eumaeus that Odysseus finally reveals himself to Telemachus for who he is. There's a, a beautiful epic simile here in book 16 where Homer describes the reunion between Odysseus and Telemachus. He says it's like the cries of birds whose young chicks, rough farmers, have stolen out of their nests. The tears of this father and son were that piteous. They would have sat there weeping together all night, but they had work to do. Now, there are a few other significant moments of reunion that are important here. There's Penelope, of course, uh, but we'll get to that later. In the meantime, Odysseus will, will go to his home and he'll, he'll be reunited with Eurycleia. This is the nurse who helped raise him as a child. And in what is a really touching scene, Eurycleia recognizes Odysseus by a scar that he has on his leg, a scar that he had gotten from an injury when he was a child. It's this beautiful reminder that sometimes it's our pain, it's our sufferings, it's our scars by which people recognize us. These are the things that that might uh, best identify us. And then there is Argus, Odysseus's dog. Argus was left behind as a puppy when his master went off to war. In book 17, Odysseus returns to his palace, and there, sitting on a dung heap, is Odysseus's old, broken-down pet. He's been laying there in the yard of Odysseus's palace, mostly neglected since Odysseus left. When he sees Odysseus, he recognizes him. He wags his tail. He, he drops his ears in greeting the way a, a, a loving dog would when his master returns home. And then as Odysseus enters the house, Argus dies. He's content after 20 years because he's seen his master. Now this brings us to the third stage of Odysseus's homecoming, revenge. It's here that the Odyssey is most like Homer's other work, the Iliad, in its violence. It's also here that the justice of the epic works itself out against the suitors. After Odysseus arrives at the palace, disguised as a beggar, the suitors unsurprisingly treat him poorly. They mock him. They ridicule him. But at Athena's urging, Odysseus bides his time. Finally, at the beginning of Book 21, Athena prompts Penelope to propose a contest. This is a contest that is going to set into motion Odysseus's plan of revenge. Odysseus had left a, a bow behind when he went to war, and the contest says that Whoever can string Odysseus's bow and then shoot an arrow through the holes in 12 axe heads would win Penelope's hand in marriage. One by one, the suitors try to do so, but they don't even have the strength to, to put the string on Odysseus's bow, let alone to shoot an arrow using the weapon. Telemachus joins the competition, and he comes closer than any of them. This is a sign that he has truly become Odysseus's son. Remember, this is why Telemachus went on his journey so that he would be able to, to sort of achieve something like the status of his father. But Odysseus waves him off. Finally, it's proposed that the old beggar, Odysseus in disguise, takes his turn. The suitors think this is the funniest thing they've ever heard until Odysseus succeeds. Like a musician stringing a lyre that he, he makes the bow sing. And then, as the color drains from the suitors' faces, he shoots the arrow through the axe heads. And then, with Telemachus at his side, father and son set about absolutely laying waste to the suitors. These, these men who have treated his family and his estate with such contempt. 
What follows is stanza after stanza of carnage. And this is where the, the warrior culture, the, the warrior ethos of this book might collide with our own sensibilities. As we wrestle with this violence, we wrestle with what it says about heroism. At the end of the bloodbath, when Odysseus orders the servants to scrub down the halls of the palace, it's clear that while this violence has reestablished Odysseus in his rightful place, Odysseus's home needs to be purified in order to pave the way for what comes next. The final stage could be described as restoration, or we might say reconciliation. It's here that the fighting subsides. It's here that Odysseus is restored to his wife, Penelope. And it's here that he is finally, after a 20-year absence, restored to his status in, Ith in Ithaca. Perhaps unsurprisingly, there are some final challenges standing in the way of Penelope's and Odysseus's reunion. After all that time apart, Penelope is not completely ready to trust that her husband is back. She's not completely ready to believe that the man standing before her is in fact her husband. So she poses a test. She asks that before she spends the night with the man claiming to be Odysseus, the marriage bed should be brought into the room. Odysseus knows this is impossible because Odysseus knows, Odysseus knows that he had carved their bed out of an olive tree and then the palace was built around it. This is a, a symbol of the durability and the steadfastness of the marriage because Penelope is convinced that only Odysseus not a stranger would know this fact. She welcomes him home. The two spend the night together and Odysseus tells her of all or at least most of his adventures. But morning awaits and with it, one final conflict that needs to be resolved. The families of, of all the slain suitors come out to take their own revenge on Odysseus for killing their sons and brothers. And it looks as if Odysseus is going to wipe out virtually the entire population of Ithaca. But for the final time in this epic, Athena intervenes. She comes down and appears in all her glory. She commands the suitors' families to go home so that peace, or at least an end to the fighting, can be established. And so the violence, and with it this poem, comes to a close. And Odysseus, after his long time away, is home at last. Thanks for your attention. Um, I hope this was helpful.